Good evening. My name is Sam Rogers, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Memorial Mania, Issues of Commemoration and Affect in Contemporary America. Throughout the course of its history, the design and tone of American war memorials have constantly shifted in scope and cultural impact. A major catalyst for change occurred after September 11, 2001, and coincided with an increased public fascination with modern art. Our speaker this evening will address the influences of historical perspectives on the planning, organizing, and construction of memorials throughout American history. She will also discuss how America's sense of national identity has been shaped by fear and terror, and how memorials reflect the culture and social psychology of the temporal period in which they were built. Erica Doss is a professor and the chair of American Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Since obtaining her PhD in Art History and American Studies from the University of Minnesota, Professor Doss has dedicated a great deal of time to studying issues surrounding war memorials and other forms of commemoration in the United States. A former director of the American Studies program at the University of Colorado, Professor Doss is also a well-published author and editor of works including Public Art Controversy, Cultural Expression and Civic Debate, and Spirit Poles and Flying Pigs, Public Art and Cultural Democracy in American Communities. Professor Doss is the recipient of the 98th Distinguished Research Lectureship from the Council on Research and Creative Work in the Graduate Program at the University of Colorado, having served as the 2005-2006 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in American Studies at the University of Southern Denmark. Professor Doss is an expert on the driving factors behind American culture and modern art. At this time, I'd ask you to turn off all electronic devices. In addition, please hold any questions until the end of the presentation when there will be a question and answer period. Because we're recording this program and because some audience members are hearing impaired, please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be passed to you before asking your question. And now please join me in welcoming Professor Erica Doss. Thank you, Sam, and um, I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me to Dickinson College, and thank you for turning out this evening. Um, is it okay to use the microphone now and then maybe use this little other microphone later? Where is my audio person? Is that is, okay? I'll just do that if that works for us. Okay, um, I'd like to talk tonight about a phenomena in contemporary America that I like to call memorial mania. Um, recently, for example, if we can get this thing to move here. There we go. Um, recently, for example, the nation has dedicated memorials to dead astronauts, executed witches, the greatest generation, that's the National World War II memorial there on the left, um, and victims of lynching. This is a memorial that was dedicated just a few years ago in Duluth, Minnesota, in commemoration of a, memori of a lynching that took place in June of 1920. The United States has also erected memorials that paid tribute to civil rights, cancer survivors. The Cancer Survivors Plaza that we see here on the right is one of 28 cancer survivor memorials that has been built so far in the United States by H&R Block Foundation, which anticipates building an estimated 50, one for each state of the nation, um, within the next decade. We also have memorials to Rosie the Riveter and the female industry defense workers of World War II, uh, the Indian victors of the Battle of Little Bighorn of 1876. In June of 2007 in Washington, the Victims of Communism Memorial was dedicated. This is a 10-foot tall bronze replica of the goddess of democracy, a sculpture loosely based on the Statue of Liberty that was erected by Chinese student dissidents in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Now, equally omnipresent are temporary and what seem to be spontaneous memorials, those makeshift offerings of flowers and candles and balloons, sympathy cards, teddy bears that precipitated sites of tragic and traumatic death, the World Trade Center in 2001 or Virginia Tech University about a year ago. 
We see these sorts of temporary memorials too along our roadsides, our highways, where shrines like these commemorate the 43,000 Americans that die every year in car accidents. Now, these few examples suggest that today's memorials are wildly divergent in terms of subject and style, and few of them hold to any sort of classicizing style or impetus from the past, from earlier generations. Collectively, they represent what I'm calling memorial mania, which I'm defining as a contemporary national obsession with issues of memory and issues of history and this urgent, almost excessive desire to claim or to secure those issues in American public culture. Security, in fact, as a corollary to fear, helps to account for the nation's growing body of terrorism and 9-11 memorials. Over 600 artists and architects, for example, competed to design the Oklahoma City National Memorial. This is a three and a half acre, $29 million memorial that was built to the 168 people who died because of Timothy McVeigh's murderous act of domestic terrorism in 1995. The nationally televised dedication of this memorial included a speech by President Bill Clinton, who described the memorial as, quote, a public stand against terrorism. Competitions for the three major 9-11 memorials in the United States, in Washington, in Pennsylvania, and in New York, have been equally urgent and have seen thousands of entries. Um, the jurors for the World Trade Center Memorial uh, sorted through 5,200 proposals. Um, this is just some of the finalists here. Before they ended up picking reflecting absence, this is a tree-lined plaza, which will be punctuated by two huge spatial voids located on the footprints of the former Twin Towers. And each one of these voids, and we can see this on the far left, is over four acres in size. And they will be filled with waterfalls um, or recessed pools of water. And then these pools will be banded with the names of the dead. Um, there will also be ramps bordering these pools, which will go into this gigantic underground memorial center. And this will be filled with artifacts recovered from the World Trade Center, um, including crushed fire trucks and all sorts of architectural fragments. This memorial is now called the National September 11 Memorial and Museum at the World Trade Center, and it will be dedicated in 2011 on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. In the meantime, this is just some of the few um, 500 or so 9-11 memorials that have already been built in the United States. How they get chosen, what they look like, and what they mean is highly contested. In fact, controversies over contemporary memorials, I think, tell us a lot about anxieties over who and what should be remembered in America today. And the growing numbers of these memorials in particular, I think, represent efforts to try to anchor or resolve those anxieties. The attacks of 9-11 certainly heightened the sense of urgency, um, this anxiety that surrounds memory um, and memorialization today. Within hours of the attacks on the World Trade Center, New York became filled with temporary memorials um, erected in parks and on street corners. Now, originally, of course, these were signs. Have you seen so-and-so? I'm looking for this person. Very quickly, within a matter of hours, as it became evident that there would be few survivors, those signs became memorials. Within days, the entire country was engaged in debates about how 9-11 would be permanently or officially memorialized. And on the right is a sketch by the contemporary sculptor Louise Bourgeois um, for a proposal for the memorial, which, consi which uh, consisted of a gigantic star at the top um, of a very, very large building. Other people suggested leave a pile of ruins, leave nothing, turn it into a park. In New York, public fury about turning Ground Zero into a park 
or a playground for art, there were several museums that were proposed at the site, led to the activist group Take Back the Memorial. Um, and this is an alliance of 9-11 family members who insist that their personal trauma privileges their management of this $600 million national memorial. This will be the most expensive national memorial built in the United States. The estimates originally, two years ago, were that it was coming in close at $1 billion as a price tag, um, and it's been cut back or scaled back a little bit to $600 million. That's a lot of money. Issues of naming are especially contentious at this memorial. Plans to randomly name those who died at 9-11 on the lower walls of these two very, very large pools in a design that the architect calls meaningful adjacencies or sort of a random approach to naming have not been acceptable to those who feel that rescue workers should be accorded special status and separate status, um, and by still others who feel that their names should be accorded or distinguished according to kinship or company affiliation. So those who worked in certain areas of certain towers should be grouped together in named categories. Um, in today's memorial culture, in other words, it seems that Random is out, while authenticating categories of status as identity seems to be the new rule of thumb. Terrorism Memorial in Pennsylvania has also been fraught. Architect Paul Murdoch had an original design for the Flight 93 Memorial uh, called Crescent of Embrace. Now, how many of you have followed perhaps some of the controversy over the Flight 93 Memorial living here in Pennsylvania? Okay, um, the original design for the Flight 93 Memorial in Shanksville um, included the elements that we see here, a concrete tower of voices which will house 40 white wind chimes, a plaza marking the flight's uh, the plane's flight path, um, a marble wall listing the names of the 40 hijacked passengers who died in the crash, and a grove of red maple trees planted in a bowl-shaped veil that a handful of particularly paranoid blogospherists determined was actually a jihadist symbol of Islamofascism. Demonstrating the same sort of keen visual insight that you know, informed similarly, in my opinion, ludicrous post-9-11 websites insisting that Satan's face can be seen in the dark clouds of smoke surrounding the Twin Towers there on the top left. Um, conspiracy theorist Alex Rawls, R-A-W-L-S, posted a detailed analysis with charts and maps and polar coordinates that proved that the memorial's crescent, as we see here on the right, was pointed toward Mecca, and that the Tower of Voices with those 40 wind chimes was, quote, an Islamic prayer, prayer sundial. Someone at Paul Murdoch's architecture firm is trying to plant an Islamic flag on the bodies of our dead heroes, says Rawls, calling Murdoch a, quote, terrorist memorializing scum. And you can see all of this at his, um, his blog site, which is errortheory.com. Now, whether or not any of this Islamophobia is rather cynically overdetermined, um, Alex Rawls is the son of moral philosopher John Rawls. Um, and Alex Rawls is likened by his critics as sort of the Mark David Chapman. Um, that's the guy who killed John Lennon um, in 1980. He's, he's, he's sort of called the Mark David Chapman of the blogosphere. Uh, whether or not any of this is cynical and overdetermined, Rawls's criticism on a blog created a public art and memorial firestorm. Much of this firestorm raged over what kind of memorial is actually being built in Shanksville. Is this a memorial to the victims of terrorism or is this a memorial to the war on terror? And the blog sites on this are quite interesting. Um, one blogger remarked, I'm an old-fashioned type. I don't want to visit remembrance ponds 
reflection areas, hope and healing centers, or anything like that. I want huge bronze statues. I want flags. Or as another put it, we've had enough of this panty-wasted, new-agey, pop psychology healing nonsense. We're at war. It's time for anger and vengeance. Healing is never appropriate for a war memorial. Okay, now, terrorism memorials. Memorials that commemorate the victims of terrorism are among the most heated or passionate sites of public culture today. And I think they're ideal sites to investigate the cultural ethos of this country um, since 9-11. Their growing numbers suggest that things, things like memorials, embody what we might call a cultural turn toward public feeling and toward the authenticity of public feeling, toward affective modes of knowledge and comprehensive, comprehension. Memorial mania seems to be almost simultaneous with an experiential turn um, in contemporary understandings of history and memory and identity. Consider, for example, heightened understandings of experiencing history. Today we have Civil War battle reenactments where players dress and eat and talk like long dead Union or Confederate soldiers. And this is not, of course, a reenactment that's just relegated to the Civil War. We also have um, Vietnam era um, battle reenactments. Or consider the growth of interactive museum exhibitions like the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas. How many of you have been to the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas? Where you can stand near what's called the Sniper's Nest, where Lee Harvey Oswald fired at John F. Kennedy. Down here on the right, you can see the kinds of tourists who hang out in the road where the car went by. And in the road, our gigantic X marks the spot where the first bullet and the second bullet hit John F. Kennedy. There's a live earth cam feed from this uh, site as well, which has literally generated millions of hits. I recently visited the National World War I Museum in Kansas City, um, different war, a, a new museum full of high-tech bells and whistles, which includes this glass bridge, which is suspended over a field of about 9,000 artificial poppies, each one representing 1,000 soldiers killed in that war in the United States. Um, it also includes simulated trenches filled with gas masks, weapons, helmets, and an amazing 20-minute spectacle featuring film clips, battle sounds, and flashes of colored lights projected above a life-size diorama of shell-shocked soldiers trudging through the sort of muddy moonscape of the Western Front. Now today, these visceral modes of experience, these sorts of sites at these museums, the Holocaust Memorial Museum um, in Washington, are regarded, these sites are regarded as primary vehicles of knowledge and identity acquisition. Alison Landsberg maintains that these new forms of public cultural memory and mass technology, what she calls prosthetic memory, enable anyone to personally experience the past, no matter how remote or distant or traumatic. Of course, as historian Joan Scott argues, discourses of experience are both highly illuminating and highly problematic. They give visibility to often marginalized historical subjects, but they also buffer them from critique when experience or experience alone is understood as authentic or is reproduced as an epistemology of fact. The key, she says, is to attend to the historical processes that through discourse position subjects and produce their experiences. It is not individuals who have experience, but subjects who are constituted through experience. As a cultural historian, I'm especially interested then in the role that affect plays in the making and meaning of contemporary American memorials and the role that memorials play in the fabrication of American uh, public subjectivity, who we are, how we think about being American. Memorials are, in a sense, the physical, visual embodiment of public affect. They are a public archive of feeling 
and they're encoded in terms of feeling in their material forms, in their narrative content, and in the ritual practices that surround their production and reception, how we relate to them, what we bring to them, the sort of cultural baggage um, that we attend to. As Lauren Berlant argues, the complex circulation of emotions and the broader socio-cultural and socio-political implications of this sensual turn, this interest in public feelings, demands a critical realm of the senses that considers what feelings are made out to mean and which forces, which meanings are magnetized by concepts of affect and emotion. Affect is omnipresent in contemporary America. I mean, just take a look at these particular images. Contrary to some sort of Habermasian vision of this rational, ideal, collective public sphere in which sensible citizens exchange ideas and unite in progressive or democratic action, American public life is marked by emotional appeals and affective conditions. Consider how public feelings are mobilized and manipulated in current and recent elections. Consider how they're mobilized and manipulated in ongoing debates over reproductive rights and abortion politics, over Terry Schiavo, over the war on terror. These affective conditions, I think, do not foreclose the possibilities of social and political transformation but they do beg for some sort of critical pedagogy of public feeling, which recognizes how and why and which feelings shape historical moments, concepts of citizenship, and understandings of self and national identity. And that's why I'm so interested in memorials, and in particular memorials that are about terrorism and 9-11, memorials about fear, now fear, especially fear of terrorism, dominates contemporary American understandings of national identity. Fear certainly dominates current political discourse from President Bush's post 9-11 declaration that his primary focus was to route terror wherever it exists to the Justice Department's declaration that protecting Americans against the threat of terrorism was strategic goal number one. Coverage of the war on terror dominates mass media. We're five years into the war of terror this week. These color-coded terror alerts that we are very familiar with on the right dominate American public movement. Um, we are and have been at level orange for quite some time now. And these feelings of fear dominate public, public feeling in general. A, recent survey by the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, for example, found that more than three quarters of Americans believe that there will be more terror attacks in the United States, although less than 50 percent had confidence in the government's ability to protect them. National anxieties about terror and terrorism are understandable because terrorism is repeatedly framed on national terms as an attack against America. Although people from 92 countries were killed in the attacks on the Twin Towers in 2001, their deaths were obscured within a largely uncontested appraisal of the World Trade Center as a symbol of only America, and of the attacks on New York as attacks on the entire nation. Further characterized as a national trauma, 9-11 was perceived as an assault on American innocence as represented in this fairly popular crying eagle image that we see on the right, which you can find on many blog sites and many websites, also t-shirts um, and also bumper stickers. Um, this was a devastating blow that victimized all Americans and simultaneously mandated a shared therapeutic recourse in the war on terror. Now this sort of sweeping presumptive, what we might call national symbolic, transforms all Americans into the subjects of a collectively held history. Local tragedies become the index of an official national culture. Acknowledging them becomes the purview 
of national political claims on their meaning and memory. As President Bill Clinton described Oklahoma City's terrorism memorial at its dedication, this tragedy was a national tragedy, and this memorial should be recognized and embraced and supported by the entire nation. For politicians, terrorism memorials are ideological rallying grounds. For family members and for survivors, these are sacred sites of bereavement and often burial. For millions of tourists, these are authentic destinations marked by tragic death, traumatic loss. Uh, critic Lucy Lepard describes this as tragic tourism. And terrorism memorials are among America's top tourist destinations. 600,000 people tour the Oklahoma City National Memorial every year. It's anticipated that 7 million people will tour the National September 11 Memorial and Museum at the World Trade Center once it opens in 2011. And even the Flight 93 National Memorial in remote rural Pennsylvania anticipates visits from approximately 230,000 people when it finally opens, probably in 2010. Terrorism's threat to the self and to the nation is managed in these particular memorials through design elements and textual references that stress security, stability, and heroism. Many of these memorials share, for example, what we might call a redefined uh, minimalist aesthetic, which manipulates normal understandings of space and time in order to evoke traumas disassociated of effects of fear and anxiety. So what we see in these memorials are towering monoliths, angled walls, recessed forms, reflective surfaces, and gridded units, you know, unit upon unit of these tight grids, all of them strewn throughout huge spaces. All of this, I think, gives this a purposely disconcerting atmosphere in these particular memorials. We see pits, we see voids. We also have an aesthetic of what some people call absence. Overall, this is very destabilizing. There's an emphasis on sort of destabilization at these memorials. There's a tension between how big these memorial spaces are and also how intimate they are, how you're expected to feel or experience in these very anxious and discomforting spaces. Note, for example, that the tomb-like gates of the Oklahoma City National Memorial frame both the actual physical location where 168 people died. And on the right, you'll see that there are 168 chairs, and they're grouped in five rows according to the five floors where bodies were recovered on those five floors. 19 smaller chairs are grouped in a section where 19 bodies of the children in the nursery were recovered. So there is a direct correlation between the chairs and where bodies were found. But you'll note, too, that the gates also have times on them. The east gate reads 9.01, the west gate reads 9.03. The moment of the blast was 9.02, April 19, 1995. That means that when you're in this space as a visitor, you re-experience the temporal and spatial dislocation of Timothy McVeigh's terrorist act and the deaths he generated. But each gigantic gate is also etched on the inside with the memorial's mission statement. And this is a document that the memorial's commissioning agency uh, labored over for months and intended as the guiding directive for the memorial's design. Here's the mission. We come here to remember those who were killed, those who survived, and those changed forever. May all who leave here know the impact of violence. May this memorial offer comfort, strength, peace, hope, and serenity. Terrorism memorials are also framed, in other words, by socio-therapeutic notions that trauma can be represented and must be cured. Hence, we see the affirmation of hope, healing, renewal, and closure in their design. And we see this written reflecting pools, waterfalls, manicured lawns, clusters of trees, and beacons of hope 
At night, for example, the glass bases on each one of the 168 chairs in the Oklahoma City Memorial are illuminated by small lights that the designers describe as, quote, beacons of hope that will inspire Oklahoma City, the state, and the nation to rebuild and prepare for tomorrow. However informed by notions of traumatic disruption, terrorism memorials are intended then to be lasting, fixed, and highly selective national narratives. In various writings, Freud distinguished fear and anxiety in terms of their relation and response to danger. Fear, or fright, was an affect prompted by specific psychological and physical threats, while anxiety was the state of con confusion, the distress prompted by expectation of those threats. Now these distinctions are fairly ambiguous. Even Freud defined a real angst or realistic anxiety in terms of fear. Um, and psychologist Sylvan Tompkins later argued that, quote, terror be recognized as the same affect as fear and anxiety. So fear, terror, anxiety, all sort of combined into one. Manifest in nervousness, uncertainty, and blind resentment, fear and anxiety are untenable states of insecurity that neither the self nor the nation can tolerate. Fear and anxiety are often abated or controlled in comforting and safe spaces. And those safe spaces are, for example, the familiar settings of our homes or the routine and order of our workplaces. The violation of these safe spaces is then especially jarring. And efforts to restore these safe spaces are very, very quick. Less than a month after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was created. Of course, as Amy Kaplan writes, the very formation of such a department, of such an agency, works to generate forms of radical insecurity by proliferating threats of the foreign linking within and without national borders. So implicit within this narrative of security is the notion that the self and the nation are at danger, are at risk. Security narratives, security memorials, embody efforts to tame and control these threats to prevent their repetition and to restore harmony and order, to work through the trauma of terror or terrorism, among other national insecurities, and to generate closure. Anchored in specific historic realities, like 9-11, these contemporary terrorism memorials focus on explaining danger and resolving danger for us. Paradoxically, of course, they also generate or depend on generating fear or feeding crisis and perpetuating national insecurities. Security narratives like national unity, innocence, and heroic sacrifice repeatedly symbolized with images of eagles, children, flags, and firemen are typically employed in today's terrorism memorials and 9-11 memorials. Now, innocence, and I've purposely selected the memorials that we see here, innocence has long been central in the American national imaginary, um, liberating the nation and its citizens from a legacy of historical and moral misdeeds, sustaining a state of blissful ignorance, uh, what Berlant calls infantile citizenship. Assumptions of national innocence permit a lack of culpability in matters that require adult moral agency and encourage a sort of self-righteous consensus that pits American exceptionalism against an evil and dangerous outside world. I want to make this clear. There is an enormous difference between the trope of national innocence that I'm explaining here and the actual murder of innocence. The people who died in the bombing of the Oklahoma Federal Building and the people who were killed in the attacks on the World Trade Center and in Pennsylvania and at the Pentagon on September 11, 2001 were absolutely innocent victims of horrific acts of terrorism. Yet from the moment of their murders, their deaths were manipulated to sustain politicized assumptions of national 
innocence and to legitimate national security agendas of revenge and recovery, including the war on terror. In fall of 2005, I visited the temporary memorial for Flight 93. How many of you have been to Shanksville? Um, okay. And found a site full of references to patriotism and the war on terror. Parking lot railings were covered in handwritten slogans such as God Bless America, I Love My Soldier, bumper stickers read United We Stand, and It's Not Just a Flag, It's a Way of Life. Many of the SUVs at the site similarly featured vinyl stickers stenciled with yellow remembrance ribbons and the words support our troops, and we're all familiar with those. Uh, political scientist Michael Billig describes these familiar forms of banal nationalism um, and suggests that they prompt the presence and power of the American state. Daily, the nation is indicated, he says, or flagged in the lives of the citizenry. Nationalism, far from being an intermittent mood, is the endemic condition. At Shanksville, um, a site of tragic death is reframed in terms of flag-waving vengeance, political self-righteousness, and fundamentalist Christianity. Um, other bumper stickers at the site, for example, read Red State Insurgency, and my favorite, which you can see over here on the left, is Back to the Bible or Back to the Jungle. The temporary memorial itself includes a large wooden cross surrounded by American flags and religious mementos. Now, other 9-11 memorials, and again, just a few of the many that have been made in recent years, include pieces of the World Trade Center. New York City gave away tons of, literally, of steel I-beams and other scraps to hundreds of towns anxious to acquire genuine, authentic artifacts from ground zero. Uh, justifying his city's <clears throat> request for a piece of the Twin Towers, the mayor of Lake Charles, Louisiana, remarked, for example, well, why wouldn't we? 9-11 didn't just happen in New York, it happened in all America. Obtaining debris from both the World Trade Center, and here we see two 12-foot steel beams, and the Pentagon, um, a 700-pound slab of limestone from the building, uh, the mayor explained that these pieces of history are visible reminders of the tragedy of 9-11 and that his town would use them as symbols of the strength, determination, and resolve which unite us as one nation and of our dedication to the principles of liberty and justice for all. For many Americans, the mangled remains of the Twin Towers are potent cultural touchstones that embody national pain and sacrifice, and then assume the sacrosanct dimensions of holy relics. Sometimes it takes a physical reminder to convey the spiritual feeling you have for an incident, um, said the mayor of Martinez, California, who secured a few pieces of World Trade Center steel for his small town. It speaks to your soul. Some 9-11 relics um, have been expressly consecrated. Chunks of steel acquired by Albuquerque's Sacred Heart Church were blessed with sacred oil by its Roman Catholic bishop. These sacred symbols of loss and sorrow, these venerated artifacts, are also informed by narratives of national rage and revenge. As the designers of the Texas State Cemetery September 11 Memorial forcefully put it, <coughs> we want people to feel that these relics were washed in the blood of the innocent. We want people to recognize the horror, to understand the sorrow, the righteous wrath, the resolve, and remembrance. This memorial features two iron girders salvaged from ground zero. It also features text from George W. Bush's address to the nation on October 7, 2001, <coughs> when he announced the start of Operation Enduring Freedom and declared, quote, we will not waver, we will not tire, we will not falter, and we will not fail. Peace and freedom will prevail. <coughs> Excuse me. In Austin, 
and elsewhere, 9-11 relics sanctioned the war on terror. At a Kid Rock concert <coughs> for U.S. troops in Iraq in 2003, for example, a piece of recovered metal <clears throat> from the World Trade Center was passed among soldiers who, one observer related, lunged at the opportunity to touch the steel that symbolized what so many of them felt was the purpose of their mission. Similarly, at a pro-war rally held at Ground Zero just a month after U.S. Marines toppled this statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad five years ago this week, New York Governor George Pataki told the crowd, let's melt it down, let's bring it to New York, let's put it in one of the girders that's going to rise over here as a symbol of the rebuilding of New York and the rebuilding of the United States of America. The war started here, he said, on September 11, 2001. Fusing these sacred relics of 9-11 with notions of unity, innocence, and sacrifice, many 9-11 memorials frame the memory and the meaning of 9-11 in terms of the righteous American military's retaliation. Note the American eagle that we see here grasping a piece of World Trade Center steel in its talons. Some 9-11 memorials simply employ a pseudo-minimalist aesthetic. Green Bay, Wisconsin's 9-11 World Trade Center memorial features two 30-foot stainless steel towers mounted on a pentagon-shaped base inscribed with the names of 9-11 dead. I point out that this abstract memorial replaced a much more popular fiberglass statue of a Green Bay Packer receiver over here on the right. Um, this was moved down the road to a local brewery. <sighs> Beer. This memorial in uh, Bellin, New Mexico, similarly consists of these sort of unmodulated geometrical forms, these vertical shafts of, of marble on top of this quintet of granite um, that emulate the Twin Towers and, and the Pentagon, albeit in minuscule scale. Other memorials, however, employ what we might call an aesthetic of verisimilitude, um, you know, realism, that legitimates their reverential and romantic narratives as authentic history. This precisely modeled bronze sculpture of a 9-11 rescue dog features a dramatically posed German shepherd on an I-beam, outfitted in protective vest and booties, intently searching for survivors in World Trade Center rubble. This eight-foot-tall sculpture includes debris from Ground Zero and commemorates the heroic willingness and loyalty of 9-11 rescue personnel, human and animal. Likewise, We Shall Never Forget, which we see here, features bronze figures of a stockbroker on a cell phone, a fireman, a police officer, an emergency medical technician, and a rescue dog all posed on a pedestal that features the words hope, bravery, and peace. Now, these sorts of memorials imply that figurative commemorations of 9-11 are attached to these narratives of heroism, courage, and survival. But consider Tumbling Woman, a larger than life-size bronze of a naked woman in perpetual free fall that artist Eric Fischel sculpted to honor a friend who worked on the North Tower's 106th floor. Intended for temporary public display uh, on Rockefeller Center low, uh, Rockefeller Center's lower level. Tumbling Woman was seen for just eight days in September 2002 before it was screened off and then it was finally removed for being called shameful and exploitative. A few weeks later in a New York Times op-ed titled A Memorial That's True to 9-11, the artist observed the experience of 9-11 led me to think about what constitutes an appropriate expression for tragedy. As an artist, as an American, one question still preoccupies me. If we cannot face what happened, how can we move past it? Yet his realistic portrait of loss and vulnerability, one that actually matches the actual circumstances of death for many in the Twin Towers, was deemed aberrant in a post-9-11 America that prefers narratives of heroic rescue and survival. In indeed, a lot of these 9-11 memorials eulogize first responders 
as policemen, firemen, and emergency medical workers are now called. Contemporary anxieties about national security have not only created new heroes among firefighters and law enforcement officials, but have revitalized Cold War gender constructions of heroic men and dependent women. One third of those who died in the World Trade Center were women, a number which includes several female first responders. But almost all 9-11 memorials, including many dedicated to firefighters and the all-male cast of We Shall Never Forget, reify an image of reinvigorated manhood. During this war on terror, that image is hardly surprising. 9-11 memorials featuring heroic first responders certainly inspire patriotic fervor, or are meant to. But they also embody narratives of heroic sacrifice, of spilling blood for the nation. Freedom's flame, which is a proposal here on the right, um, exemplifies what Carolyn Marvin and David Engel describe as an American civil religion of blood sacrifice, whereby dying for the flag is naturalized as a fundamental facet of national purpose and identity. This proposal features a 35-foot wall set on a round platform and wrapped by exit stairs filled with victims moving down and firefighters and first responders moving up. Freedom's flame is oriented so that each September 11 at precisely 8.45 a.m., a symbolic shadow will fall across its facade. Its mission statement reads, the character of a nation is defined by the combined strength of her people, of the men and women dedicated to public safety and the victims of the World Trade Center attack, a strength forged and tempered in freedom's flame. Freedom's flame, when consumed by freedom's flame, these, um, these uh, victims of the World Trade Center attack, only serves to steal the resolve and strengthen the character of all America. Still, I think the most blatant 9-11 blood sacrifice narrative is probably the Flight 93 memorial. Now, anticipated, this is anticipated as a 2,200-acre site guided by the slogan, a common field one day, a field of honor forever. Its mission statement reads, may all who visit this place remember the collective acts of courage and sacrifice on the passengers, on the part of the passengers and crew, revere this hallowed ground as the final resting place of these heroes and reflect on the power of individuals who chose to make a difference. Yet speculation persists about what passengers and crew actually did and said during this doomed flight. Let's roll that call to arms announced by one passenger and used by President Bush to justify U.S. bombing in Afghanistan was probably, the World Trade Center 9-11 Commission later found, the phrase roll it and may have referred to removing or moving an aisle blocking airplane service cart. This has not, however, altered now legendary accounts of Flight 9-11's 93's, excuse me, collective act of courage and sacrifice. Courage and sacrifice is represented in movies, books, and memorials. The fact that 40 people were murdered and four others killed themselves in a suicidal act of terrorism is overwritten by a national narrative of heroic patriotism. <clears throat> As Homeland Security Director Tom Ridge put it in 2002, America is grateful to the 40 victims who won the first battle in this war on terror, adding that these 40 met the challenge like citizen soldiers, like Americans. Not all of those who were murdered on Flight 93 were American. One passenger was a Japanese citizen, another was German. Yet Tom Ridge's phrase, citizen soldier, aligns them all with the US troops celebrated in Stephen Ambrose's popular history of World War II, citizen soldiers, and similarly cast the war on terror as a good war, World War II. 
the blood sacrifice of American victims of terrorism is honored also by Congress. In 2003, the House passed the True American Heroes Act, which awarded Congressional Defense of Freedom Medals to every government employee killed in the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on 9-11, and every passenger and crew member on Flight 93. These sweeping assumptions of collective national courage undermine the heroic acts of individuals and reinforce assumptions of blameless national innocence. There is nothing heroic about being murdered in a terrorist bombing or aboard a hijacked airplane. To suggest otherwise is to spin the murder of innocents into the martyrdom of self-sacrificing citizens and to justify their deaths as the highest call of American patriotism, which is, of course, how terrorism memorials operate. But memorial culture isn't this straightforward. This is, after all, memorial mania. And battles over New York's 9-11 memorial, I think, are beset by competing notions of what to remember and how to manage these memories. And it continues to be this battle with people battling over not just the placement of names, but the look of the memorial, the cost, etc. Initially, the attacks of 9-11 generated a sweeping sense of national unity, glued to the TV glued to the computer screen. Americans were uniformly unable to stop looking at repeatedly visualized images of crashing planes and dark clouds of smoke. These kinds of images shaped a national narrative of fear that cast all Americans as traumatized participants in a three-act performance. First, as the victims and or survivors of an attack on the nation. Second, as rescuers responding to the tragedy through an enormous collective demonstration of help and generosity, and I'm talking here about the offers of aid, of money, of blood, of rescue. And third, finally, as flag-waving patriots vowing revenge. But even as this third act was being staged, national unity began to disintegrate as some Americans began to ask why 9-11 had happened and questioned the government's response, such as the quick manufacture of the Patriot Act. Indeed, a recent survey found that more than one in three Americans, 36%, believed that the federal government itself had a hand in orchestrating the terrorist acts of 9-11. Today, while the shocking imagery of 9-11 remains fixed and perhaps fetishized, in American national consciousness, there is no single national narrative about 9-11, which is why its representation is so contested. Let me consider here an end with the conflict in terms of contestation over race and representation um, regarding New York's first responders. Early plans for a memorial involved commemorating the 343 firefighters who died at the World Trade Center with a very large 19-foot bronze based on what we see here, newspaper journalist Tom Franklin's photo of the three of them hoisting an American flag at Ground Zero. This was sort of 9-11's version of uh, the iconic flag planting, planting moment at Iwo Jima. But those plans were scuttled because the proposed sculpture represented them on multicultural terms, white, Hispanic, and African American, rather than the all white guys that they really were, like 94% of the New York Fire Department. Accused of political correctness and rewriting history, the donor who said he wanted to pay tribute to all the firefighters who died on 9-11, including 24 people of color, withdrew the commission. As the attorney hired by the three firefighters put it, the heroic trio was disappointed that the memorial had, quote, become something political as opposed to historical. Becoming something crassly commercial, however, was just fine. The vast merchandising of 
Franklin's photo drew little or no debate, save that among the lawyers who were hired for the three firemen and the lawyers who were hired for Tom Franklin's newspaper who haggled over issues of intellectual profit and intellectual property. <clears throat> this image has been reproduced on t-shirts, teddy bears, snowboards, Christmas ornaments, humidors, pocket watches, pocket knives, bank checks, jigsaw puzzles, pajamas, and phone cards. It's also been recreated by Madame Tussauds Wax Museum <clears throat> in a multimedia extravaganza called Tribute to the Heroes of 9-11, which apparently opened in Times Square in 2002 and then traveled to several American theme parks. For high-end customers, 40-inch bronzes, $10,000 each, titled To Lift a Nation, are also available. Um, we see these here. As Marita Sturkin observes in her recent book, very good book, Tourist of History, the attacks of 9-11 enabled a widespread consumerism of security, a frenzied consumer response to the fear of terrorism. Endlessly reproduced, endlessly commodified, <clears throat> Tom Franklin's picture celebrated the, quote, victorious resurrection of the American nation, born again, innocent but hard. The flag raising by men in uniform gives notice to the world that Americans stand united and eternally ready to ensure their hegemony by force of arms if necessary. The conflicts over to how to manage this iconic security narrative as a memorial manifest in belligerent insistence on an authenticating all white narrative representing that hegemony suggests that this national narrative is far from fixed. Indeed, heated public feelings about terrorism memorials, whether firefighters in New York or Islamo-fascist crescents in Shanksville, are indicative of a larger national pathology about 9-11 itself. Memorializing 9-11 is beset by the nation's inability to conceptualize 9-11 on discursive rather than fractious terms. And these terms are driven by fear and the twinned narrative of security. The problem isn't just one of knowing the facts about 9-11, but grappling with their cultural and political workings in meaningful rather than paranoid ways. I think Americans really do want to visibly mourn the victims of terrorism. A recent survey showed that 94% of those polled felt that a 9-11 memorial should be built in New York and that every American should visit it. But perhaps the solution lies in memorials that hold a presence for their subjects without reifying tropes of national innocence, blood sacrifice, military reprisal, or racism. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs> Your talk um, <clears throat> makes me think that um, the memorials that have been with us for a while somehow um, proclaim, anyway, to innocently access the collective memory. Uh, but what you're saying, what I interpret you to be saying, is that for every um, um, part of the, of the collective national memory, if you will, uh, that a memorial symbolizes, uh, a predominant conversation, let's say. There are lots of sub-conversations, uh, most of which are politicized or um, economized, if you will, if they, if they uh, tie into a national economy or in some way represent uh, some kind of an ideological stance. I think that what happens over time is that uh, we tend to uh, forget about those sub-conversations and somehow fix on something that we naturalize into a predominant conversation on which we think there's consensus. But the interesting part about a memorial, so to my mind, and, and here, uh, for example, a Vietnam War memorial has been with us for so long, right? Uh, but what that evokes for the 
uh, people who leave memorabilia there, Zippo lighters, uh, poems, uh, religious artifacts, and that kind of thing, is that it actually opens, if it's a successful memorial, uh, for the participants, the affective part you're talking about, it, it op reopens the sub-conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, for, to, to my mind, that's one of the ways in which you can differentiate between a successful uh, memorial and a non-successful memorial. Uh, again, just to not, uh, finish quickly, uh, if you look on the other side, I was always, I've always been fascinated by the realistic memorial on the other side of the Vietnam Memorial, which is, um, like the firemen, uh, a multi-ethnic memorial, hyper-realistic uh, of uh, weary soldiers. And very few people go there because it's closed-ended right. and it has fixed the dominant conversation and freezes out the sub-conversation. Right. <clears throat> You'll note that I didn't use words like successful because I actually think these are pretty successful if the goal is to create this perpetuating notion of American innocence, et cetera. So I think they're highly successful memorials in that regard. But I'm glad you brought up the example of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, um, which is considered the most successful memorial in Washington. Now, by success, what do we mean? We mean popular. It's certainly in the top two. It was the top um, memorial visited in Washington. The stats are about three and a half million people a year visit the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Just recently, the uh, National World War II Memorial beat it out. Um, it's up to 3.8 million. Um, but I think you're raising a really important point about what the Vietnam Veteran Memorial allows is perhaps a variety of response because people are allowed to leave things. There's a variety of discourse that goes on there. And I think what's so interesting about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, hotly debated, despised memorial, Ross Perot tries to stop it, is how today it's been claimed by most conservative elements of the country um, as the outstanding memorial. In other words, um, there's a group in Washington, Rolling Thunder, which is a group of motorcyclists who <clears throat> circle the Capitol every Memorial Day, very conservative group of vets, who, when protests were planned about a year ago against this current war, and there was some blog discussion, oh, they were going to harm the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, these anti-Iraq war folks, Rolling Thunder shows up to protect the Vietnam War Memorial. I mean, it's just uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It's just bizarre to me the way that that memorial has shifted in terms of how it's understood by different generations of Americans. Um, but that, you know, that, that's, a, that's a different story entirely. Um, I do talk in one of the chapters of the book about the distinction between the National World War II Memorial and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial um, in terms of which group um, <clears throat> wanted which memorial and what each memorial represents to different Americans. So. I actually think a lot of these 9-11 memorials are very successful. They're just kind of scary in terms of their success, for me at least. So, yeah. um, uh, you, keep, you, you keep using the word successful, or like he brought up the word um, successful memorial. I hope not. I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like that's a relative, like, um, that's a relative statement. Like, um, if the if the memorial like say it's trying to um, portray like uh, I don't know like um, it's trying to make you feel kind of sad and like or like trying to help you get over like the event and it actually does that then I guess it's a successful memorial but like but what do you think or like what memorial like what what makes a good memorial mm -hmm. like is it is it supposed is it is there like a set thing that a memorial is supposed to do for you, or, or is it just whatever the person who's making the memorial, like wants, like it to be? Well, it's a good question. I, I think every memorial has a different purpose. There is no template for memorial culture, so a lot of it is going to depend on what's being commemorated, who's making it, and who's commissioned it. So there will be a big difference between those who wanted a Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which was Vietnam Vets, and those who wanted the World, National World War II Memorial, which was also, interestingly, a Vietnam Vets generation. Um, not necessarily a greatest generation, but a boomer generation. Um, but um, it, a lot depends on who's commissioning the memorial, where it's going to be placed, and what kind of story it's telling and to whom. All right, so there's no particular template. What would be a successful memorial in my mind is something that creates um, a lot of discussion. 
I'm not so sure even as I come into the end of this book that I'm much of a I'm, I'm much in favor of everything keeping or lasting forever either, but I don't really want to get into that right now. Um, and I don't mean to imply success or failure. I'm simply telling stories about how folks respond because what I'm most interested in, and I'm using memorials as my, as my foils here, is public feeling and how these memorials are getting people together or engaged in this culture and being really angry um, about memorials. Um. I'm going to press you on the question of lasting forever. Um, after World War I, thousands of bronze doughboys were set up nationwide. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's worked with Save Our Sculpture, a nationwide, I'm sure you're familiar with the group, knows that these things are just deteriorating and disappearing into, the, uh, into rust, at the very least. Um, how many of these non-federal monuments, just a ballpark guess, are set up with an endowment to provide them with long-term conservation. That's a great question. Or will question. they just simply go the same way as all the, uh, the doughboys? Right, and you're talking about the 9-11s, the multiples that I showed. That's a good question, and I would, I would say very few. Now, I, I have been on a few public art commissions, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure many in this room have, and increasingly there is an understanding in the 21st century that if you're going to build something, you better have some money to take care of it. It's kind of like starting a college and having an endowment. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I, I doubt that very many of them have into perpetuity um, the kinds of dollars that will be necessary to polish the bronze, apply the new patina, replace the brickwork. I just saw a Bataan Death March memorial that had just been put up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, not more than three years ago, and the patina was disappearing already, and the brick pavers that are very popular with a lot of memorials were already chipped. So, it's, yeah, it's a great question. So. I wonder if you could go back to that issue of gender, because uh, so much of your images deal with images of men and so much of what you've been talking about involved men who were outraged from Ross Perot to Rawls mm -hmm. and Shankville. Do, is there a difference in the reception of these objects or the experience according to gender or how we create these objects? It just seems to be the images that deal with war and terrorism are dominated by images of men or images that appeal to men. Right. But where do the women play in this? I don't understand. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, in the chapter on war memorials, I tried to get around the idea of um, the recent push in the last decade or so, beginning, I think, with, not really beginning with, but the good example is Glenna Goodacre's uh, memorial to the women of the Vietnam War, which is the third component to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, there's the three fighting men, and then there's Glenna Goodacre's piece. Since then, there have been a number of initiatives to create women in war memorials. Um, a lot of them are figurative. A lot of them have been highly controversial among women vets. And the reason for this is that women vets are themselves conflicted about the image of the woman veteran as being too masculine, um, not looking enough like a woman. When um, sculptors, for example, in West Virginia for a whole series of war memorials showed a woman in contemporary khaki, you know, what women where today, in, in wartime, there was objection so that the commission actually fell apart on the basis of the objections that were raised by women vets. Um, that's a really good question. Now, in terms of the 9-11 memorials, there are a lot of women sitting on the commissioning agencies, um, you know, who must be putting up with, I suppose, this use of children and, and, and eagles and Bibles and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I haven't really come across a lot of discussion among women who are objecting to the presence of uh, an overwhelmingly male figure to first responder base, except in the war memorial case. So. Women are getting involved in making memorials on, in other ways, quilts. There are other memorial practices that women are engaged in as well. In fact, I don't think there's any real difference except perhaps how each gender is choosing what memorial uh, resource maybe to, to tackle. So, uh, that's good. In the back? Yes, as a former archivist at Kent State University, I had a chance to experience a big clash between institutional memory and personal memory. 
if you talk about Dr. White or Alan Ken Foreman, you had whole different views of it. And what the institution wanted for their monumental memorial to mm -hmm. the students were slain was totally different from what yeah. the survivors had. You brought something that that's, that notion has been sticking in my mind since I've worked there. What do you do about the roadside memorials? Because recently there's been a controversy on the east shore of a property owner who protested that a family erected a memorial to their son who basically killed himself by losing control of his vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the, the property owner removed it. Uh, a family was protested. And the issue comes up as whose memory, mm -hmm. whose right to remember. And whose public space. Yes. Right. Now, was this public space that the property owner removed it from? or? No, it was. Private well, space. Well, it's private space, but the way the codes worked, there's a variance. And, so, and it was publicly seen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, this is a hot topic. <laughs> um, and not only in terms of the history of the roadside memorial. I mean, we, we think these are fairly recent. They're not. They go back as far as car culture and then even further in, in the American Southwest. Um, but it also has a lot to do with what kind of boundaries we want to we want to play with this in this country um, regarding freedom of speech in the public sphere, but also the separation of church and state. Um, in Colorado, there was a very um, important case about six years ago um, in which a fellow driving down Highway 70 every day, coming in from the mountains into Denver every day, had to go past a roadside memorial that featured a cross. And finally, one day, he said, "I was sick and tired of seeing this blatant." expression of Christianity in the public sphere, picked up the roadside memorial, threw it in the back of his pickup truck. The next day, he was arrested for defamation of, you know, I don't know, ritual or ceremonial property. He took it to the Supreme Court of the state of Colorado and won the case. And what he won the case on was the separation of church and state. Um, and the result of all of this was this, that Colorado became one of a growing number of states in the nation that are now banning individually made uh, roadside crosses in general in favor of officially sponsored roadside markers that say things like, don't drink and drive, New Jersey has put this together in memory of um, Joe Davis killed here January 17th, 1999, something like that. So, I mean, I think this has enormous um, repercussions in terms of those two. Um, who's going to control freedom of expression in the public sphere and then the separation of church and state? And these rules are having mixed impact. Um, in Alaska, for example, there's this rule. No, no one can make a roadside altar, you ha a roadside cross. You have to go through the state. You have to pay a fee, and they will mount something for you. But there's been so much violation of it that the state can't enforce it. So you know, it becomes really, really interesting. Um, some people look at this in terms of the people are in the public sphere, and they are populist, and they're controlling the public sphere. I'm not so sure I buy that argument, because I think a lot of it is the people are in the public sphere um, putting their religious expression in the face of all of us, and not all of us necessarily want to be reminded on a daily basis of what happened there or that religious expression. So I think it's really complicated. And I appreciate your comments about Kent State as well. So, I mean, there are multiple memorials at Kent State. Um, I can think of at least three, several of them mounted by students, one of them the official um, memorial space that was put together by the president and board of trustees as well. Plus, there's the annual remembrance ceremony every May. So. One quick question, which you don't need to answer, but it's just something I'm thinking about, which is Katrina, but we'll maybe put that aside. But in terms of memorials and who are we going to remember and what stories are we going to tell? Um, so that might be something you want, might want to respond to. But the other piece comes from um, the, your article on the World War II memorial. And you talk in that about how um, the construction of the World War II memorial kind of reframes um, the Lincoln Memorial Mm. and the Washington Memorial, because it's linked to the, to the Grants um, Memorial as well. Right. So I just wonder if you could talk about that. We didn't have a chance to sure. talk about that in class today, but it's, it's, it's how 
the, reintro the introduction of that um, memorial makes us, if you will, read the mall and read the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial differently. Yeah, the National World War II Memorial is situated right on top of where the Rainbow Pool used to be, right by the reflecting pool, right up of 17th Street. So it's right between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. And if you walk down the two-mile expanse from the Lincoln Memorial up towards the U.S. Capitol, you walk then Lincoln Memorial, National World War II Memorial, Washington Monument, and then the Civil War Memorial, which is in front of the U.S. Capitol, and it becomes then a series of four war memorials. Um, but that's not exactly how we used to think about the Lincoln Memorial or the Washington Monument, but that's how I think we now think about these four spaces, that it becomes Civil War, World War II, Revolutionary War, Civil War, leading up to the steps of the U.S. Capitol. But of course, we can't walk up the steps of the U.S. Capitol anymore. We have to go through the big visitor center underneath the U.S. Capitol, and the steps are now closed off. So um, yeah, I think it's had an enormous impact on what Washington means now. And for me, it has become this mall of war. And you know, one thing I might end with is think about how different it might have been if the Reverend Martin Luther King Memorial were placed where the National World War II Memorial is, and what then the mall would have meant. Lincoln Memorial, Reverend Martin Luther King Memorial, Washington Monument, Civil War. This could have been a trajectory of civil rights and emancipation, et cetera, instead of a trajectory or a national identity of war, war, war. So, thank you very much. <laughs>